Radiation levels at Reactor 2 of that plant recently reached their highest level since March 11, 2011, the day a massive tsunami and earthquake triggered the meltdown. The situation was so dangerous that TEPCO, the company that owns the plant, couldn't even send a robot down to investigate. So how worried should we be by the news coming out of Fukushima right now? Joining me now is Kevin Camps, radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, welcome back to the program. Thanks a lot, Tom. Great to have you with us. So walk through, walk us through this. What's going on at Fukushima right now? You know, a number of commentators, uh, Arnie Gunderson at Fairwinds, Kendra Ulrich at Greenpeace International, uh, Nancy Faust at Simply Info have pointed out that the levels of radioactivity that are being talked about by Tokyo Electric, 53,000 53, rem per hour levels that were documented just a week ago, um, have probably been there this whole time, since March of 2011, since the meltdowns happened, because what they're doing is they're getting closer to where the melted cores are at. They still don't know where they're at, but what they're doing is they're getting closer to that dangerous place. And so sure enough, you know, it stands to reason that they would find these levels. And the way they found it this time was with a camera on a pole, shoved down a, a pipe or a tube, and they actually measured, they, they back figured that the electronic noise on the image was giving them that level. They haven't even gotten radiation monitors in there. <laughs> and that's something we've talked about before, whether it's a robot or a radiation monitor or a camera. And just yesterday, they sent in a robot with a camera that they had to pull out quickly. And to my knowledge, it's the first time they've been able to get a robot out of there before it died. And so the gamma radiation levels will destroy electronics. And they used that phenomenon yesterday or a week ago with the camera to determine how high the radioactivity levels are. That's that's mind-boggling. Now, is this the, this is at uh, the unit two? Unit number two. Unit number two. That's yeah. and, and that's the one that apparently has burned through the core, through the bottom of the tank and into the ground. Well, this truth be told, probably units one, units two, and units three have all had um, reactor pressure vessel melt throughs through the bottom. Tokyo Electric hems and haws about it. But the imagery coming out of Unit 2, these actual photographic images are showing, for example, a metal grate that has a great big, some reports are two meters wide hole melted through it. And granted, there's some devilish details to figure out. Is it a melt through? Was the damage caused some other way? But it all stands to reason that that was the melt through through the bottom of the reactor pressure vessel. The big question is, where did the melting stop? It hit the floor, which is the containment structure, how far into the floor did it burn? And there's actually a, an exothermic reaction when it hits concrete, it's gonna be a self-feeding chemical reaction. And so what they've been doing for nearly six years now, it was a little rough at the beginning for sure, is they've been pouring 100 tons of cooling water per day, per day on these melted cores to keep them cool enough that they don't reignite and burn deeper. And that's the big question. Have those melted cores burned all the way through the bottom of the containment and entered groundwater? That would be pretty bad. Or is there simply this groundwater flow? Because we know there's radioactive groundwater going in the ocean. So is that groundwater flow, and there's a lot of groundwater passing through this site, is it just picking up contamination from the surface of the soil, uh, deeper down? Is it intercepting wastewater streams inside the reactor buildings, or is it hitting melted cores in the groundwater. You said 53,000 rads. Or, per or hour. Per hour. Yes. So um, uh, a rad, uh, rads and rems are, you know, emitted, absorbed, right? But, but mm -hmm. um, basically functionally the same thing. So, uh, or for measurement. So 53,000 rads, one rad, one thousandth of one rad is one millirad. How much radiation is like in an x-ray? The equivalent of that? Uh, you know, X-rays get less and less as the technology it's like advances. It's ten, like five millirem. Yeah, five, five or ten milli yes. one thousand for a chest X-ray. So yeah, yeah. So so this is. Yeah. Boy, I, you, I can't well, even do the math. On it that. would I mean, be if a human were to be near this level without radiation shielding at a close distance, you would be dead in less than a minute. I mean, we're talking seconds would result in a fatal dose, and that's why even remote-controlled robots are frying in there. So it, you know, the significance is. Tokyo Electric has said it may take us 30 to 40 years to decommission this ruined nuclear power plant site. That may be wildly optimistic. It may take 100 years? Arnie Gunderson has been saying for a long time it'll take a century or more to decommission Ooh, Fukushima. Wow, wow. And Chernobyl uh, is another example of that kind of time frame. Yeah. A new study has come out saying that uh, residents of Fukushima, the people who lived in the town near the power plant, 
we're actually exposed to about 15% less radiation than originally believed. Um, is this uh, spin from TEPCO, is this, is this even relevant? I mean, uh, a 15% uh, decrease in you know, uh, radiation implies that there's a safe radiation level. There, there is no such thing as a safe level of radiation, is there? Oh, those for, yeah, there's no safe level of exposure. And the higher the exposure, uh, the worse the impact. And the exposures accumulate their damage over a lifetime. And so those first days and weeks of the catastrophe were wildly out of control. And there was no monitoring. They didn't have measuring devices all over the place figuring out how bad. And in fact, a mayor of a local town, on his own initiative for lack of information from the federal government, the prefectural government, decided to evacuate his town to get out of this harmful situation. And they ended up evacuating right into the path of the worst releases and were outdoors in it. And he accused the government officials of murder for putting them in that position. And so I'm very distrustful of any statements coming out of Tokyo Electric right. that are positive. Right. To what extent does nuclear policy play a role in U.S.-Japanese relations? It's huge. Um, you know, there's an image that MSNBC, I believe, just put out because of this Abe visit, and I was kind of blown away by it. It showed President Eisenhower, this is in the 1950s, uh, the father of George H.W. Bush, Senator Bush from Connecticut. Prescott Bush. Yep. Yeah and the prime minister of Japan at the time, who happened to be Abe's grandfather, golfing in Connecticut. Back then, and still now, the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, one of its central planks is pro-nuclear power. And that was arrived at with heavy US influence. It's a long story, but including central intelligence ag agency influence back in the 1950s. And Abe, despite his mentor, Koizumi, being passionately anti-nuclear now, a complete reversal for Koizumi. Despite Abe's wife being anti-nuclear, Abe is sticking to the pro-nuclear plank. And you can bet they, that Trump is talking about Do they have power. the same problem in Japan that we have here of, of money and politics? I mean, is he doing that because the nuclear industry is funding his campaigns or his party? Or is this, or is there an ideology behind it? I, I, I don't it's get it. It's a mix it. I mean, of both. Uh, the nuclear power industry lobby in Japan is very powerful. It always has been since the 1950s. And in fact, the Japanese parliament concluded that the root cause of the Fukushima catastrophe was collusion between regulatory agencies, the nuclear power industry, and elected officials like Abe. The thing is, though, we have as much collusion or more so here. I was just going to say, is this, is it, we have similar problems here. I, you know, I, yeah. We had that situation, what, a year or two ago where, where the, the rivers were going up. Uh, what was the power station? I, it was the Missouri River. Oh, though, Fort which, Calhoun. Fort Nebraska. Calhoun, that's yes. right. Uh, you know, we're, we were within a foot of, of, you know, one of our own nuclear power plants being flooded out and, and possibly losing their, their cooling and all that sort of thing. Um, they, what about Donald Trump and nuclear power? Do, you, do we have any sense of where this administration is going? Well, we expect the worst and are geared up to fight against it. Um, you know, he seems to really like dirty, dangerous, and expensive polluting energy industries, and nuclear is one of the worst. Well, they're, so, they're profitable and they give a lot of money to politicians. I mean. Yes, and I'd say, you know, Trump's rhetoric about for every new regulation, two have to come off the table. Well, you know, applying that to the nuclear power industry is really frightening because right now, you know, the regulations on the books are not being enforced. So if you're going to start removing nuclear safety regulations, radioactive waste safety regulations, and a real telling example is Trump's pick for energy secretary, former Texas governor Rick Perry. One of Rick Perry's top campaign contributors, Harold Simmons, a Dallas billionaire, happened to own a radioactive waste dump in West Texas. And so guess what? I'm about to rush down to West Texas for hearings next week. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is on the fast track to rubber stamp a operating license for a de facto permanent parking lot dump for high-level radioactive waste, over half of it in the entire country. Rick Perry is going to sign the contract as energy secretary that would cost taxpayers billions of dollars. This company is going to get rich. It's still owned by the family of his big donor who died a few years ago. And it, all the risks and all the liabilities are on the taxpayers. And wow. it's a wonderful revolving door if you're into making a fortune on radioactive waste at public risk. This site is above the Oglala Aquifer essential for drinking water and irrigation water for numerous states for, on the high plains. For, you know, right, yeah, right through the center of America. That's mind-boggling. Kevin Camps, it's always great to have you with us, Kevin. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much.